Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at Korea University this morning to talk about uh, Korea's international security policy. Um, I've looked at the curriculum of this course, and uh, this course covers all aspects of Korea's um, diplomacy. And this is a, uh, indeed a serious stuff. So going into the, the serious stuff, oh, one more thing. I've been um, dealing with uh, this uh, North Korean nuclear issue and security challenges for the last 20 something years out of 38 years in diplomatic service. And um, given what's happening to North Korean nuclear weapons programs, the diplomatic efforts, um, I can't say, succeeded in spite of this uh, combined efforts of my country, of the United States, of Japan, of China, Russia, all international community. And the reasons, the central reason, as you know, is that we do have a persistent, persistent pursuit of nuclear weapons capability in North Korea. And up until uh, Kim Jong-il's days, um, up until 2011, the second North Korean leader, North Korea professed and promised that they would never develop nuclear weapons. Um, they, they merely wanted to um, develop a um, atomic energy uh, capability like any other peace-loving country in the world. Not that we believe that, but at that time there was a basis for us to talk about how we are going to address this challenge of nuclear weapons capability in North Korea. And we have had several agreements um, on the assumption or on, on, the, on the promise that North Korea would not complete nuclear weapons development. But come the third leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, the current leader, in 2011, he um, he uh, threw away uh, all the strategic ambiguities, all the nuances, and made the matter actually very simple and straightforward for all of us. That is, North Korea is not going to give up nuclear weapons capability. They have secretly developed nuclear weapons. They have lied to the international community. That last sentence is my sentence, not their sentence. But in any case, that's what they say. I mean, they have. Um, deceived the international community all these years. Now they have nuclear weapons and they will never give up. And uh, they might be willing to talk with the international community, but the talk should not be about North Korea giving away nuclear weapons. So that's um, the, what the central issue is today uh, facing us. And this is a challenge to the Korean people challenge it to the neighboring countries in the United States, and also a fundamental and very important challenge for the international community, especially international non-proliferation community. Now, <clears throat> before going into that um, difficult stuff, something that um, not many people want to talk about these days, um, as a way of introducing myself, I want to touch upon uh, some of the things I did um, as a diplomat. I, um, I had a title, Diplomacy on the Ground. Um, I, I, um, I chose this title because uh, before I got into the foreign ministry myself, back in 1980, I thought that um, diplomats are all about a, um, noble talks, ideas, whining and dining. That's a good part, actually. Um, and um, um, nothing like um, uh, people on the street. But actually, after some years working as a diplomat, I quickly found that actually diplomats' work are not that different from the work of the ordinary people, the work of the people in the street. Let me illustrate. Now, the, the first one, the case is of one should never give up. Well, 
for a couple of years, I worked as chief of protocol in 2010 and 2011. And chief of protocol is about uh, taking care of a, um, a uh, uh, grandiose side of diplomacy. We talk about the multilateral summit meetings. We talk about bilateral summit meetings. We talk about leaders of the country visiting another country, uh, receiving cordial welcome, red carpet treatment, uh, indeed state dinners. It's beautiful, beautiful diplomatic occasions. But behind the scenes, behind the scenes, these diplomatic functions are not that different from um, your experience going to Namdaemun market, try to haggle over the prices. <laughs> Why? Because, well, let me give you an example. The multilateral summits are always difficult to manage because you, it's, a, it's very difficult to manage one leader's visit to your country. It's, um, it's immensely more difficult to try to handle like uh, 20 leaders in your country at the same time. So you'll have to you know, uh, set down a, some strict rules of protocol to make sure that the leaders can get together and have substantive discussions. So one of the rules usually is that, um, okay, you can come into this uh, conference halls, but um, you can be accompanied by only, say, up to three working level officials. So the leader plus three officials, we call it one plus three. And then we all usually ask, because leaders love to be uh, photographed, <laughs> And leaders love their photographs in the press. So uh, how about we bring in photographer? And usually the, the answer is no. So in the first couple of multilateral summit meetings I handled as chief of protocol, I was um, following the rules. And I found out that actually some countries do have official photographers with the leaders. And um, how it happened? It's like um, um, you, you, you try to handle the, you know, who is going to enter, who is not going to enter, but you are talking about you know, dozens of people coming in, trying to come in at the same time. So sometimes some countries can bring in official photographer. So what I did after that was that I always uh, you know, make sure that the official photographer tag along with me and then uh, waiting in the vicinity of the entrance. And as soon as I see one photographer come in and I challenge <coughs> the guard, <laughs> security guard, that um, I want to bring this, pe this person in now that the other country has the official photographer. And usually, nine out of 10, we had official photographers with, with my president all the time. You know, that's what happens in the multilateral summit meetings, so you should really never give up. You should challenge and see if anything can, anything can work. The second, where your leader is seated or stands is sometimes more than protocol. Okay, uh, look at this uh, photo. That's a uh, uh, G20 Seoul summit official photograph. Um, yeah, and um, uh, the leader, um, stands uh, in a place, in a spot, on a spot where he was told to, to stand. So you, that was handled smoothly. Um, this is the outcome of very complicated protocol juggling. Because uh, uh, I want to make sure that we have a, a good photograph. I want to make sure that certain leaders stand in certain spots. And my job was to come up with a plausible exp protocol explanation that, that, that why uh, this leader st you know, stands on this spot and that leader stands on that spot. And um, <clears throat> so that went smoothly, but um, in other t at other times in other countries, I um, actually had an experience uh, to find that uh, our leader actually stood in the wrong spot. And I challenged it. And um, if you challenge, you cannot sit on your right, you have to challenge. 
if you challenge, sometimes you succeed. So it's, um, in a way, cutthroat business. <laughs> Trust, but be there early. I was promised that our leader would be sitting on a prime spot on this state, a multilateral dining table. Uh, but um, previously, I had an experience that actually our chair was, our seat was taken by other leader, and I had, a, I had trouble <laughs> trying to uh, recapture, trying to uh, take that seat back. So uh, I instructed one of my, one of my the, uh, colleagues to go there two hours early and be there, make sure that uh, this seat doesn't go into any other country. I mean, that, that's what happens. There are always people who are late for the meeting. I cannot name names here, but um, there are a couple of usual suspects who will be late for the meetings. So you'll have to take that into account when you plan for official photograph. I can tell you that some of the official photograph of multilateral summits, um, in some of the photographs, you use one or two leaders are missing. You know, and that's not very good, so you'll have to uh, take that into account. Sometimes, some leaders do not show up at all, and uh, that applies to one leader, <coughs> uh, very old leader. <laughs> so, a, um, you know, the, uh, if you are a very old person like myself, you have a certain um, room for maneuvering. You have a certain leeway. You, you can ask other people to give way, you know, if you're, you're old enough. And if you're like 80 something, 80 something that means more than probably over 60 years older than you, many of you, I think, 60. But if you're over 80, then you can sometimes get away with not showing up at the meeting, being late at the meeting, and then uh, sometimes this leader can leave, uh, like uh, while other leaders are talking very seriously, because this leader can, can be very tired because if, uh, if, if you are 80 and over, so that sometimes happens. Sometimes you do not even know the time of tomorrow's summit meeting. That happens to my official trip, uh, not with the president, thank God, with the prime minister <coughs> one time. And that was the very important meeting uh, my prime minister was looking forward to. And to my horror, I found out that um, the, the, the evening before, that actually we do not have the fixed time for the meeting as yet. And um, so I inquired, well, during, in those circumstances, actually the ambassadors are a uh, fair, fair game. So I inquired, or oh, 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 I put him into inquisition. <laughs> Uh, what the hell is going on? You know? <laughs> and we are here, um, you know, hundreds of miles away, well, thousands of miles away from Seoul, and um, I do not even have the time for the summit meeting tomorrow morning, right? And the ambassador was in a big trouble, and he would be in a big, bigger trouble if the meeting didn't take place, but um, thankfully, meeting took place. Uh, another dilemma I had that evening was, should I tell the Prime Minister that um, we actually do not have the time for the meeting tomorrow morning? And should I not? If um, I were like a um, um, tenure um, experience diplomat, I probably would have told the Prime Minister that actually that's what it is. And um, we should expect, uh, we should anticipate for the worst and be prepared, be prepared for it. But I was like uh, 25 years uh, after I entered the diplomatic service. And um, I got to understand that certain things, certain things, uh, even if you share this news with the prime minister, well, prime minister would not have a very good sleep that night, right? And he would not be as well prepared as he should be for the important meeting the next morning. And uh, what's the point? I mean, if I should get the instructions from the prime minister about what to do, and there's any way we can remedy the situation during that evening and night, I would. 
have told the prime minister and asked for his opinions. But um, uh, obviously, there was nothing I could do or he could do. And I'm just, um, you know, I'm just, uh, you know, giving away my problems to the prime minister <laughs> so that he could have, he could not have a sound sleep. So it's uh, not, uh, it, it is not anybody's interest. I, I concluded, so I didn't tell the prime minister fully uh, aware that if the meeting indeed did not take place, I would take all the blame. So that's sometimes what should, you should do. Finally, I need instructions usually means no, but some countries really need instructions and headquarters give them at 2 a.m. That happens to only one country in the world and uh, this is a good story, so I, should, I can share with you that that country is Japan. Usually when I say that I need instructions from Seoul, uh, I don't need instructions from Seoul. <laughs> I'm saying that uh, I cannot consider this positively. But um, when it comes to Japan, um, they have a very uh, well functioning system. So this system actually somehow functions uh, in the middle of night. And actually I saw my good friend, good Japanese diplomat friend actually getting instructions in the early morning hours, somehow, <laughs> and got back to us. So, no, we, we should respect the Japan's uh, uh, a, uh, work ethic, I think. The, uh, the second page, a little more serious. Always keep your first option uh, in hand. You see, the, when you go into negotiations, um, people focus upon what's going on in the negotiating room. But I can share with you that actually much greater part of what's important happened or has to happen even before you, go, you walk into negotiating room or the negotiations are in recess. So um, when you go into negotiating room, uh, the other person uh, sitting opposite the table will play hardball, and if you think he's going um, too far, and you should have an option of walking out, and you know, I cannot negotiate on that basis. If you do not have that option, then you are done. You are at the mercy of the other person. So, walk out. I refuse to negotiate, should be your first option. And for that to happen, for, for you to have that option, you'll have the full confidence of the people uh, back, in the, back in your capital. So uh, in many, if you ask many negotiators, you will find that the most difficult and most important job is, not, is actually is conducted in your capital between yourself and your bosses rather than uh, across the negotiating table between yourself and the other person. Sometimes, you find that actually the other person is more friendly to you <laughs> than your boss is in your capital. That's what happens, very important. Make clear your bottom line from the outset and stick to it. Um, it actually applies to, a, a, uh, to diplomats from, not from superpowers, but from middle powers. Uh, there are two ways. You can, um, you know, the, um, begin with a inorbitantly very high price, very tough position, and go down. Or you can quickly, rather relatively quickly, come to your bottom line, and uh, you say this is your bottom line, keep saying it, and stick to it. Um, depends on who you ask, but um, I can tell you that uh, from countries like Korea, a middle power, um, trying to negotiate important stuff with a little more powerful country, then perhaps a more, e more effective way is to make the other person understand that um, this is your bottom line. You can uh, give away any more goodies, nothing on your, up on your sleeve, and so you'll have to make a deal with this position or not. And you'll have to be, in a way, very honest about this. You'll have to explain that um, this is your bottom line because you have this important interests, and you'll have to respect, you'll have to keep these, maintain these interests. So logically, 
this has to be your bottom line. You, you, you can twist my arms, but um, nothing further uh, will come out. And actually, I uh, had relatively successful negotiations when I was uh, responsible for the defense cost sharing negotiations with the United States. Third, find whether they are ready to, ready to make a deal, uh, especially with North Korea and countries with very authoritarian system. Um, when they come to negotiations uh, in Beijing, for example, um, they somehow have this initial uh, instruction from their leadership. And um, I found that North Koreans have the habit of um, trying to find out uh, what your bottom line is. And um, once they, they have found it, other countries usually uh, make a deal if this bottom line is actually okay with you. But North Korea is Ready is usually going for another push. So what happens is that even if the deal is actually good for North Koreans as well as for the other parties, they do not make a deal. They insist they go back to Pyongyang and meet again in, uh, in one month. That's what happened in 1994 for the agreed framework. That's what happened in 2005 for the uh, September joint statement. And so in a way, the lesson here is that, um, that if that is North Korea's negotiating habit, you'll have probably one or two more cards upon your sleeve so that, because you, you might have to deploy one or two cards to make a deal. If you exhaust your all your negotiating cards, thinking that um, now you, you can make a deal with North Koreans, you might be surprised. So you should not do that. Your apparent shortcomings can work for you. Uh, that, that applies to APEC, uh, admission negotiations. That's 1991. Um, the first regional multilateral summit in Asia Pacific was APEC. And before APEC, there was no occasion at all for the leaders of this, this region to get together, having group photographs and have discussions. So APEC was the first one. And APEC began with 12 countries six ASEAN countries and six non-ASEAN countries. And China and two other Chinese economies were out of APEC. And from the first meeting back in 1989, uh, APEC wanted to invite the three Chinese economies, as we called them at that time. And um, Australia didn't succeed. The Singapore second chair didn't succeed. And Korea was the chair for 1991. We succeeded in bringing in three Chinese economy into the fold of APEC. Why? Well, fundamentally, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong wanted to come into APEC at that time, 1991. That's the most important thing. But perhaps it helped. Uh, what helped? Korea was a divided country. We engaged in all, all kinds of silly diplomatic games in North Korea about how you call yourself, how you call North Koreans, and how um, you, know, you have a, a little diplomatic upmanship uh, as against North Korea. So we, we know all the tricks. We have done it ourselves. Some of them are a little silly, actually. So we understood the sensitivities uh, involved in those negotiations. We had a patience uh, that was required for these negotiations because we had done it. We understood Beijing was very sensitive. Taipei was very sensitive, so uh, actually the division was our shortcomings, but um, in this diplomatic uh, enterprise, actually it helped Korea. So you never know. Um, your, your good points can help you. Sometimes it sh doesn't help you. Your sh apparent shortcomings might help you, so you never know. Now, um, okay. uh, very quickly, <clears throat> Korea's national security environment. The, when you uh, talk about this subject, these are the words it usually, that usually come up in the book. Korea and China like lips and teeth, and when teeth are gone, the lips will feel the cold. These days, uh, the, this word is used to describe relations between China and North Korea, not South Korea. 
Anyway, the Korean Peninsula is like a dagger to the Japanese archipelago. That's um, that what was said in the 19th century, and um, and um, that was what was quoted. Uh, that was uh, the words that were quoted when um, the the Japanese Russo-Japanese War and Sino-Japanese War took place back in the late 19th century. So because of this, perhaps, against its will, Korea often became the battleground uh, between big powers, like um, um, you know, Sino, the war between China, or Qing Dynasty and Japan in the 19th century. Uh, at that time, of course, Korea was wanted to be clear <laughs> of this warfare, but without the military capability to uh, make sure that that, that that can happen, usually, uh, even if we don't, you don't want it, you become battlegrounds. Uh, that was more pronounced in the, um, um, the war between Russia and Japan, because at that time, Korean government actually uh, declared neutrality, but uh, it was not respected. And then after the Second World War, Korea was, was not defeated, uh, was not involved in the start of the war, but um, Korea was divided and uh, still divided long after the other countries like Germany, Austria, and I would say Yemen were reunited again. So that's what happens. And um, so some people say that Korean Korea is geopolitically least fortunate, a, uh, Korea is located at geopolitical fault line, and Korea is divided, has been divided since 1945, another challenge. And North Korea is not, does not st sit still, but uh, presenting all sorts of serious challenges. So we are all focused upon about North Korea these days, but um, what about the future? I mean, North Korea is, uh, is the present challenge, but uh, we have um, latent and put, uh, the potential challenges, geopolitical challenges, even after North Korean problem somehow miraculously is settled. So you should not, one should not lose sight of this uh, bigger picture as a way of, uh, of illustrating what kind of challenges we should expect. I, um, I introduced to you the words of the uh, wise man a Singaporean Prime Minister, late Li Kuan Yew. That's what he said. And um, uh, if, um, you know, the uh, US and China uh, have found a way to work together, uh, and also US and China uh, is becoming a little more competitive between themselves, but if US and China uh, didn't find a way, um, do not find a way to work together well, then countries in this region will have to think about these wars and um, um, try to really crystallize their national security interests, their economic interests, and choose the best policies available to them. And the debate is already ongoing in countries like um, Australia, uh, Singapore, and other countries. Korea's national security policy uh, these, um, these are the words from like 2,600 years ago. Um, and these words actually make a lot of sense to the Korean people of even today, I think. Uh, the Melia is actually a, um, uh, a Dorian, uh, Melian people are Dorian people, so they are ethnically very close to Spartans. But they did, did not uh, align themselves with Spartans. And, but they actually uh, sent some money to Spartans. So at Athenians didn't like it. So they, um, they um, uh, came up with a very tough demands to Melians. And Melians uh, tried to uh, what, uh, talk sense in negotiation with Athenians, all, deploying all sorts of logical arguments why Athenians should not do this, should not uh, you know, begin war on Melians because Melians conducted themselves very fairly and should not, this kind of fate should not merit Melians' conduct. And then these are the final words from the Athenian negotiations, according to Thucydides. That is, 
The strong will do what they can. The weak will suffer, but they must. And indeed, the Athenian army uh, stormed the millions. Uh, according to the history book, they uh, murdered most of the men, and they captured most of the women and children and sold them to slavery. So that's what happened to millions. And um, the international community is, I think it's different from the international community back then, 2,600 years ago. But at the same time, we do not have a central international tribunal that can enforce laws and justice. So at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the power politics is the ultimate uh, kind of rules that still applies to the international community. And for a country like Korea, or the middle power should not be forgetful of this reality, I think. Moon Jae-in government's policy agenda. I don't, I, didn't, I, I don't work for Moon Jae-in government, so I took this from the uh, Blue House uh, the, uh, website. And uh, they, um, Moon Jae-in government announced three strategies very sensible strategies. And these are the kind of uh, policy, uh, kind of uh, policy statements you will encounter in government's websites. So this is all such wonderful words and sensible words, but at the same time, that really doesn't tell the whole story. And some of the notable elements that was picked by myself, so it's not, um, it's not Blue House, but all these words were in Blue House website. I just picked the words that might interest you. So early transfer of the wartime operational control, conclusion of an inter-Korean basic agreement, and, uh, and so forth, and so on and so forth. Uh, I work for the Park Geun-hye government. Uh, is, it, is it that different? Park Geun-hye government's policy agenda, again, three. All very sensible, also right. But notable the developments, so things that, that were done by the Park Geun-hye government, you might remember uh, the things that um, I illustrated, like you know, the shutdown of Kaesong, introduction of fair system. And these were very difficult decisions. So these developments reflect uh, the difficult decision on the part of the government. And that's what uh, collectively we did uh, during Park Geun-hye years. And uh, I will open for questions if you have them. So the, uh, whatever they say in uh, a certain government's, certain administration's websites, I think these are the fundamentals. The goals, is, goal, goals are safeguard independence and territorial integrity like any other country, secure national interests like any other country, maintain peace and deter North Korea's threats, a little different from an ordinary country, average country. And I would say that, um, in other words, we maintain and strengthen strategic superiority on the peninsula. And that's our strategic goal, I believe. And seek peaceful reunification and pursue United Korea based upon values of democracy and the market economy is something unique for Korea's national security policy. And the final one, of course, is that you will have to prepare for the future. And means, they call, they, they use the word dime, the diplomatic, information, economic, and military. We use all these means to try to achieve our goals. And this is the Korea's national security policy making structure. Uh, we have the president. We have National Security Council. That's a constitutional body uh, consisting of prime minister and relevant ministers, national security director, uh, equivalent to national security advisor in the United States and uh, President, Chief of Staff, and some of the Blue House staff. And we have National Security Council Standing Committee, um, uh, usually convening every week. Uh, we have National Security Director, Ministers, and Chief of Staff. And um, I was, uh, during Park Geun-hye years, I was part of both uh, council and committee. And under the committee, we had an, a, a working level, we call it, uh, working level coordinating committee, and I chair that committee, and that, that consists of all vice ministers of these relevant ministries. And although 
National Security Council was, has been the uh, constitutional body uh, since the beginning of the Korean government in 1948. But the first session of the NSC was held in 1993. So for decades, actually, we did not convene this body. We only convened this body in 1993. Why? Because March 1993, uh, North Korea declared that they, they are going to re, uh, withdraw from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. That was the beginning of the very serious North Korean nuclear crisis. And that was the first time when the president felt that they should, he should convene the National Security Council meeting, 1993. Uh, so two photos. Uh, the same room, the Situation Room in the Blue House. Uh, same people, the same, I mean, officials. Uh, different people, though, and different present, and, but same thing. So that's usually what happens. And usually we convene this meeting uh, like in 10 o'clock, 9.30. But because North Korea these days fired missile at 2 a.m., <laughs> And they convened this these days like 5, 5 a.m. I, I, I heard, so 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. So as it works 24 hours a day. Um, this is too long, so I'll be very quick. And I, I understand that um, this was distributed in advance, and some of them might have read it, uh, hopefully. So, uh, but um, if you... Uh, have any questions, um, anything that you can ask me during Q&A sessions. Uh, North Korea's nuclear and missile threat, that was the main challenge for over two decades for Korea. And that was the main thing I was involved in doing. Um, as I said, I, I cannot say that I was very successful, but we tried to do our best. And um, I, I like, I mean, the, the, I want to be very uh, straightforward about this so that you can get the gist of what happened. How it started? In the 1970s, North Korea imported a one Scud missile from a certain country, and they reverse engineered it. And then um, that means uh, you, just tear it, you, you tear it apart, and you put, back, uh, put it back again. That way you understand how it's uh, manufactured, right? So through reverse engineering, they uh, acquired the capability of SCUD A. SCUD A had a range of like 300 kilometers. So initial kind of um, rudimentary stuff. And North Korea developed more potent missile capabilities later on. 1980s and 1990s, North Korea um, you know, try to import a five megawatt nuclear reactor. There was another reactor, very small experimental reactor, didn't mean a lot, but that was the first reactor uh, they acquired. And uh, they acquired it from Russia, and Russia asked North Korea to become part of the NPT, which North Korea acceded to, but According to NPT rules, you'll have to, when you accede to NPT, you'll, you'll uh, you know, sign, the, the, sign the safeguards agreement with IAEA within six months, I think. But for five years, North Korea did not do it. So that was a problem for the international community. And another thing happened was uh, between South and North Korea, we negotiated and concluded South North Korean uh, non-nuclear agreement back in 1991. So these two track negotiations happened almost at the same time and um, succeeded, concluded almost at the same time. So uh, late 1991, early 1992, we had two agreements, North Korea joining NPT and acceding to IEA-EA safeguards agreement so that IEA-EA monitors can come to, to North Korea and you know, make inspections. And the other one is uh, inter-Korean non-nuclear agreement. And we had an agreement, but we'll, we'll have to have an implementing uh, protocols and uh, negotiations ensued the next year. But uh, this first set of agreements quickly um, unraveled. Inter-Korean negotiations didn't go anywhere. And um, I should 
I'll share with you that uh, we were very ambitious at that time. Looking back, uh, maybe too ambitious because we uh, demanded, I mean South Korea demanded that we would have the right to go into North Korea and uh, do the challenge inspection, we call it challenge inspection, kind of on the spot inspections, up to 54 times a year. So that is every week. And of course, that was a little too ambitious. Why we was, was so ambitious? Why IEA was so ambitious? Because, because of the first Gulf War. Uh, IEA EA did not know that Saddam Hussein was tinkering with nuclear weapons development. So US was very surprised. IEA was very surprised. All the international community was very surprised. So. Uh, the whole international community became very strict about demanding uh, inspections about another country. And North Korea was the first country after the first Gulf War. Oh, by the way, I was in Iraq when that happened back in 1990. Now, the, um, uh, so the inter-Korean negotiation went nowhere. IEA inspectors went into North Korea in May 1992 and found evidence of cheating. So they demanded special inspections under the chart of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. They can demand special inspections. If North Korea agreed to that, that would be the first instance, by the way. So North Korea refused, rejected, and instead, several months later, you know, announced that they would uh, withdraw from the NPT altogether. And they can do it because NPT has a provision that you can withdraw from the NPT, uh, citing that your supreme has to be supreme. Supreme national interests are compromised. So that, that was the first very serious uh, situation um, evolving on the Korean Peninsula. Naturally, the United Nations began talking about economic sanctions, and North Korea declared that economic sanctions are like act of war. So they will go into war. And um, so the other party, of course, began, began preparing for a oncoming of military attack from North Korea. So tensions were very, very high, uh, like uh, you've never seen it uh, these days, because many of the South Korean people stacked up food, ramen, instant noodles, and um, portable water in case there was a military attack. Now, the, many of these older generations had an experience about the Korean War. They knew what to expect, so they began preparing. And these days, people talk about tensions, but um, not many South Korean people are stacking up their food because um, you know, they have heard about the crisis talks too many times, and they just, um, you know, uh, would not take that very seriously these days. But in 1994, it was very serious. Then the, uh, the former president, Jimmy Carter, was invited. He went to Pyongyang, met with Kim Il-sung, had a um, lunch uh, party uh, on a boat in the middle of Daedong River that, um, that, um, that's flowing uh, through North Korean capital, Pyongyang, and they announced that um, North Korea would stop uh, doing the bad thing for a while, agree to resume negotiations, and agree to the potentially first South North Korean leaders, lead president's meeting. Uh, so indeed, negotiation resumed in Geneva after several months. First important agreement, agreed framework, it was called, was concluded. By the way, the first inter-Korean summit meeting did not take place because Kim Il-sung died while he, pre or he was preparing for the summit in July. So the South North, North Korean summit didn't take place, but negotiations were concluded. Main points of the agreed framework, you see, is basically freeze everything. That's it. And um, only after about nine or 10 years they will allow 
the IAEA to come in and make special inspections. That means uh, in, in, in after 10 or 9 or 10 years, the international community will know how much cheating North Korea had done. <laughs> so uh, that was the gist of the agreement. In return, in return, the international community, not international community, but Korea, Japan, United States, agreed to provide North Korea with half a million ton of heavy fuel oil every year and uh, build two light water reactors, like $1 billion worth. So that was a kind of um, a first agreement that was signed. Actually, that was the only agreement that was implemented uh, for some time. But after a couple of years, U.S. got information that North Korea is actually is cheating on the agreement again. Uh, this agreement froze the, the, the nuclear pro programs that were known to us. That is a plutonium, what they call plutonium-based uh, agreement. Plutonium-based uh, programs, rather. But um, uh, secretly, North Korea actually began a enrichment activities. That's, of course, totally against the agreement. And um, in 1998, U.S. challenged North Koreans. Uh, U.S. pinpointed one location in North Korea, Kumchangni. And U.S. said that um, we suspect that in Kumchangni, in underground tunnels, you are conducting enrichment activities. And North Koreans said that, um, okay, you can come in and take a look at it, but it's not for free. So U.S. actually provided food assistance and sent people to Kumchangni underground tunnels. The tunnels were empty, so U.S. got burned. But, but um, the suspicion, so the Kumchangni was not successful, but actually suspicion was actually uh, substantive. So after several years, uh, it, was, it came to the surface, and uh, U.S. senior officials visited Pyongyang and challenged North Koreans that we suspect that you are doing enrichment activities. Surprising to us and to, to the United States, North Korean officials said, why not? We are doing this. So that was the beginning of the breakdown of this agreed framework. Um, to be fair to North Koreans, after a couple of, no, after a couple of weeks, uh, North Korea kept silent for a while, and after a couple of weeks, that North Korea said that they did not actually said, yes, we are doing this. They only said that we are entitled to do this. So we are entitled to do this, and we are doing these uh, two different things. I checked with uh, several American diplomats who were present at that encounter. You know, the Americans have these meetings with North Koreans. Uh, not only they bring in an um, interpreter, not one, but usually more than two, they also bring in American diplomats versed in Korean language. So they double check everything. So I met and inquired um, to a couple of my friends. And they all said that actually, at that time, Kang Sok Ju said they are doing it, not they are entitled do, to do it. In any case, still controversy. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the uh, North Korea would not admit to that. By the way, in any case, uh, after that happened, uh, the agreed framework um, couldn't continue. So it was all unravelled. So uh, uh, tensions rose high again, and the um, international community was, was in confusion for, for quite a while. Uh, the difference at, uh, at that time compared to 1994 was that um, U.S. asked China uh, to get involved and help, and China agreed. So after confusion now, not the U.S. US North Korean bilateral negotiations, but six-party talks was born in 2003, and um, I was involved in that too. Six-party talks um, 
had its own amount of quarreling and, 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 and discussions and back and forth. But after about two years, uh, six party talks produced the first substantive agreement, what they call the joint statement of 2005. 2005 joint statement okay. was a comprehensive, the most comprehensive agreement so far. They um, addressed all issues, um, not only nuclear issue, but uh, relations, diplomatic relations between US and North Korea, between Japan and North Korea, economic assistance, and indeed, the peace regime on the Korean Peninsula, and North East Asia peace uh, mechanism. So all these issues, so uh, one party's concerns, all parties' concerns are all addressed, and somehow uh, got into the very comprehensive agreement. The problem, again, is in the implementation. It was a comprehensive agreement, it was never implemented. We had um, what they call the Banco Delta Asia Rao. Um, cannot get into details, but um, uh, it was a um, case of US Treasury, Treasury Department freezing some of the North Korean money in Macau. And um, that became an issue, an excuse for North Korea not to come into implementation of the agreement. That um, continued for almost two years, but uh, finally, the BDA was resolved, and uh, we had had two implementing agreements, but again, uh, one able to overcome the usual suspects, the hurdles of declaration and verification. And um, declaration means North Korea is going to report and declare all the nuclear facilities and activities. And based upon that, monitoring a regime will be established. Verification is to make sure that this declaration is actually truthful or not. So, you know, it's not like um, uh, arbitrary uh, standards. We have already a standards uh, practiced by IAEA. Um, we were trying to merely apply these standards to this agreement, but um, uh, wasn't successful, so it came to nothing. And um, since 2009, six-party talks has not been convened. Uh, who knows, but um, chances are that um, you know, we, may, we, may, we never convene the six-party talks again. But um, one importance is that um, the September 2005 joint statement is still being quoted in United Nations Security Council resolutions a, the political declarations by the G20 or the APEC, East Asia Summit, all these um, the multilateral and bilateral uh, statements, quote, uh, joint statement only because this is the last and latest <laughs> statement in which North Korea says, promised not to develop nuclear weapons. So um, that's that. As you know, the current crisis uh, happens. Um, the, before that happens, actually, Obama administration uh, coming into office, um, arguing for negotiations with North Korea, gave one important try at negotiations back in 2012. We call it Leap Day Agreement because it was agreed upon on the February 29th of 2012. So February 29th comes only once every four years, right? So it's called Leap Day. So it's called, the agreement is called Leap Day Agreement. This agreement didn't even go into haggling over implementation negotiations. It just unraveled um, after two weeks when North Korea announced the plan for a satellite launch. Um, U.S. Says, said that actually a satellite launch was forbidden under this agreement. This agreement says that long-range missile launch is forbidden. And U.S. says that long-range missile launch includes satellite launch, quote-unquote. North Korea says uh, satellite launch 
is not within the purview of this agreement. So that's that. So um, the agreement quickly, very quickly unraveled. The importance of this agreement, I should say, is that um, uh, Obama administration coming into office for a negotiated resolution of the problem uh, completely lost interest and appetite for negotiations with North Koreans. So they went into what they call the strategic patience. Uh, basically, nothing happened for, for quite a while. And uh, fortunately, North Korea did not do uh, nothing very special, with one exception that's nuclear test in 2013. So relatively quiet. And then, now, the Kim Jong-un, having prepared for a, another cycle of a, um, provocations from our standpoint, uh, the going on to the fourth nuclear test, fifth nuclear test, two tests in one year, 2015, numerous uh, uncountable <laughs> missile tests, uh, not only uh, the skirt tests, a Nodong test, a Musudan test, but also a new, new kinds of missile test called Hwasong, that is a long range missile test, the latest one, uh, they conducted Hwasong 15, a missile test on 29th of November, and that demonstrated the range that can cover probably the continental United States, although we do not know whether they have completed the mastery of re-entry technologies. Um, and then also the Pukuksung tests. Pukuksung is an SLBM test. Uh, at the moment, I do not worry too much about Bukuksan tests because they only have one uh, big submarine uh, that is capable of having a SLBM capability. It's just one submarine. And uh, if you only have one submarine, that is really a, a big threat. If they uh, build two, three, four, five submarines with SLBM capabilities, of course, you'll have to be concerned very seriously. So we are having a um, probably the most important and most serious phase uh, in, the, in the ongoing, slow moving sometimes crisis about North Korean nucle nuclear and missile capabilities. And since um, UN Security Council considers stronger actions and prediction of conflict abounds. So talks about negotiations abound too. And um, China sent special envoy, uh, wasn't terribly successful. And United Nations for the first time in several years sent a uh, Under Secretary General to Pyongyang, somewhat more successful. I do not know, I don't, I don't have the inside knowledge so I do not know what's going to happen after this, but um, what is important to me is that um, negotiations, uh, not merely, but negotiations for what? And that's important to me. The current situation, summing up, North Korea possesses nuclear weapons and also the materials for nu additional nuclear weapons. North Korea probably mini miniaturized the warheads so that some of the missiles like SCUS can have nuclear warheads. Uh, for other missiles, we are not quite sure. Hey, North Korea has different kinds of missiles. I have covered this already. And probably possess the capability to threaten my country, Japan, and all other neighboring countries within, the, within that range has yet to acquire the capability to threaten the mainland United States, mainly because of the probably not, the, not completion of the reentry technologies and acquiring the materials uh, needed for reentry, but they are fast on their way. So the questions we should ask, I believe, uh, from Korea's standpoint, I mean. So what are Korea's, what are our fundamental and central interests? I believe the central interests 
for us is to secure peace, but not subjugation. And the, the, the making building preparations, building groundwork for unification. For that to happen, we'll have to find a way to maintain and hopefully strengthen strategic superiority on the Korean Peninsula. In the 1970s and 1980s, actually, uh, when it comes to military capabilities, North Korea was uh, superior to us, uh, if you exclude the uh, US alliance. Uh, they were definitely superior. They were v very confident. They were very confident in the 1970s, especially after uh, 1975 in Vietnam. But um, after the uh, end of the Cold War, the South Korea got the upper hand, acquired the upper hand, strategic upper hand on the peninsula. Hopefully, that will lead to a peaceful unification. If we have lost uh, the strategic capability of superiority on the peninsula, then this is a whole new ball game. It's not just, just about nuclear weapons. It's about the, um, our core interests and probably the survival of the Republic of Korea. So, I believe that we should avoid, I mean, Korea should avoid giving North Korea a strategic superiority. North Korean nuclear capability from military standpoint, while huge problems, are not the game changer because they do not have a sufficient second strike military capability to be able to actually give an assured threat to the United States and others. So you see, this can lead to a nuclear stalemate, but I do not think, I do not believe that this will lead to a nuclear superiority on the part of North Korea. But if you give away um, enough, more than enough, then that will change. So nuclear weapons themselves are not game changers, but Bad negotiations can change the fundamental strategic balance on the Korean Peninsula. Again, I'm, I emphasize, I, I, I'm, I talk this, I'm talking about, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this uh, from Korea's, Republic of Korea's standpoint. So we'll have to make sure that North Korea actually gains nothing tangible, simply because they have nuclear weapons. You see, the, uh, they have nuclear weapons, huge problems, uh, they might try to go into a um, exhortation games, whatever. But if you stand firm, not give them anything tangible, they would not get anything tangible. So um, I'm not saying we should go into war with North Koreans. No. And far from that, I believe that we should go into negotiations. But negotiations for a denuclearization, negotiations for non-nuclear Korean Peninsula, not negotiations uh, the leading to the situation where North Korea preserve nuclear weapons and we do not have nuclear weapons, and then you have somehow uh, reduces or pulls out uh, forces from the Korean Peninsula, and somehow U.S. Uh, the um, assurance of, um, of um, nuclear umbrella weakened after the negotiations. If that happens, of course, a Republic of Korea's strategic uh, position will become precarious. Um, okay. So, what should we do? Denuclearization, not freeze. We can go into freeze, we can talk about freeze. Only if, only if this freeze is uh, the face uh, leading on to the complete denuclearization. Think about the past negotiations when North Korea promised that they, they have no interest in developing nuclear weapons. And we concluded negotiations for a freeze, but they didn't keep their words. Now they are saying that they would never give up nuclear weapons. And under these circumstances, if we negotiate for a freeze, the freeze will probably become an open-ended freeze. The freeze in itself, freeze the problem. The freeze is, it is reversible. You can always reverse it, and we have nothing left. So that's a problem. 
and sustain increased pressure because pre only with pressure we have a fighting chance, only fighting chance that North Korea might change its mind. We have to un unavoidably in go beyond WMD-related uh, sanctions. We began, I mean, Uni United Nations began with WMD-related sanctions, and lately they expanded their sanctions that includes coal exports, for example, that's not directly linked to WMD development. Why? Because we'll have to put pressure on North Korea to have any chance of having uh, negotiations. Uh, this is a little, um, you know, some like it, some do not like it. Don't be afraid to disrupt and undermine the regime. My logic is, you know, the past negotiations, in a way, put it differently, is negotiations try to separate the North Korean regime from nuclear weapons. That's what we are trying to do. Still, we are trying to do the same thing. The United States National Security Advisor, you know, a couple of times said that the U.S. is not interested in, um, in undermining North Korean regime. They are only interested in removing nuclear weapons capability. So the international community is not looking for a regime change. But if North Korea insists upon keeping nuclear weapons, in other words, if North Korea insists upon not being separated from nuclear weapons, what should we, I mean, what can you do? You have to put, you have to increase, increase the pressure on North Korea so that North Korea might realize that nuclear weapons actually um, do not help the regime survival because of North, nuclear weapons, North Korean regime survival might be in question if that's the conclusion North Korean regime uh, arrives at, only then North Korea can, will, will be able to, will, will, will become uh, more sincere and serious about talking about non-nuclear Korean Peninsula. Uh, military options is not, not good options. Not good options and also it's, a diffi it's difficult options. Um, U.S. Um, is, uh, there are ways, there are ways the military options can be played perhaps, but very risky, very, very risky and very costly. So it's not very easy option for any country. At the same time, uh, all options must be on the table uh, so that you will give a North Korea, a strategic a resting place, so to speak. Oh, whatever they do, they shouldn't be afraid of military options. If, if that's the case, of course, uh, you know, the, we cannot, we, we will not be able to exert maximum pressure on North Korea. Uh, in turn, that will reduce the chances for negotiation. So this is a kind of games, um, dangerous games, but the kind of games, games nonetheless that we'll have to play. And I do not under, underestimate the, um, the dangers of military options, but at the same time, I value and believe that um, the fundamental national security interests are the core of the issue, rather than we're gonna have military options or not. It's a difficult thing, very delicate thing. You should be wary, but, but at the same time, at the end of the day, um, you will have to find a way to make sure that uh, you are not being, you are not being um, subjugated strategically by North Korea after all this. And that's the most important thing from the perspectives of my country, I believe. The final one is a kind of um, something normal, usual, that is always keep your plan B ready. Uh, you know, the, uh, we, you, you, you do not uh, seek, um, um, directly seek North Korea's regime change. You do not have enough policy means to make it happen, to be honest. 
But at the same time, because of internal contradictions, North Korean regime might be um, in, uh, in chaos. Uh, that happens. That can happen, I mean. If that happens, you'll have to have your plan ready. And it's, um, it's only prudent for a, um, for a country to have this uh, with you. So uh, things are not very good. But I can add that things were never good with North Korea. Um, as somebody says, North Korea is a country with only with lousy options, not good options. You'll have to choose from bad options. The least bad option is probably your choice rather than best option. But um, when things get very serious like this, like now, I think what you should do is to you go back to basics. You really contemplate what you are trying to achieve and what are your fundamental interests. Um, is tomorrow's news headlines is your fundamental interest? Is, um, is um, political popularity of a certain administration your fundamental interest? Or you have a more lasting, enduring, and uh, most important uh, national security, security interests uh, you are trying to talk about. Usually, these fundamental national security interests do not come to the fore because we live in a world living by new cycles. And uh, what's going to happen uh, tomorrow usually is more important than what's going to happen in 10 years. But North Korean nuclear crisis has come to the stage today that we'll have to really make decisions based upon your fundamental interests. Otherwise, the world uh, you come to know uh, will might, I say, I say might, might go away. So this is a very, very critical time. Right. Thank you very much.